lifestyle is number one. And then it's, if you're super, super high risk, we're going to be on a, a lower a lipid lowering medication. And if you're in between, we're going to have discussions, right? The discussions are which medication do we need a medication? Do we just need a lifestyle? Do we need to get a, a CAC score done? All these things. It's very nuanced. You know, I don't want you to just think about, Hey, I need to follow an algorithm. All right, and welcome back, everybody, to episode five of the second season of the Building Lifelong Athletes podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Renke. Thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Today, we're going to talk all about the 2018 ACC slash AHA guidelines. Essentially, this is a huge overview, um, big topic, big you know journal article that was put together, pretty much recommendations from these two big societies on how we handle lipid management. So essentially, it's kind of what you need to know, how we manage that, and kind of a big overview and like the guidelines we use in the medical field of how we you know think about managing lipids. So we're going to walk through this document. It's a pretty big document, but we're going to walk through it kind of step by step and I'll kind of highlight the things I think are really important and we'll go from there. So let's get going. All right. So first, I just want to mention here, this is a disclosure taken directly from the guidelines saying the ACC and AHA sponsor the development and publication of clinical practice guidelines without commercial support and members volunteer their time to the writing interview efforts. So essentially what they're saying is there is no conflict of interest in this. You know, this is not funded by any pharmaceutical industry or pharmaceutical company or anything like that. It is, you know, these people are volunteering their time because they care so much about this. So I think it's just always important to mention because I know a lot of people, especially when we talk about lipids and cardiology, things like that, they'll say, oh, you know, people are bought off a big farm, but here, you know, that's not, not the case at all. And actually they removed three authors during the process. They found out they did have some ties to pharmaceutical industry. So they took them off as they're going. So this is a pretty darn cool thing, I think. All right. So first the methods, how they got this all together. Well, what they did, they, you know, searched a bunch of different terms like hyperlipidemia, cholesterol, LDL, you know, names of medications, a bunch of different things. They searched them on websites like PubMed, Cochrane Review, Embase, these databases that holds, you know, thousands and thousands of papers. And, you know, they're looking at papers from the range of 1980 to 2017. And essentially then a separate group did a systematic review on specific questions that were relevant as well. So they kind of looked at overall these, these keywords looked at it, and there were specific questions that people did systematic reviews on those specific questions. And so this was a multidisciplinary group as well. You know, they were looking at cardiologists, internists, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, pediatricians, nephrologists, all these people, there's so many things. And, and, uh, so there's just a huge, huge amount of data that they went through here and kind of got it there, but that's, that was the general evidence. In terms of evidence too, I think it's always worth mentioning this. This is a kind of a picture we took from the article, but it kind of shows what you know, the recommendations, right? So on the left, we have the class or strength of recommendation. On the right is the quality of the evidence or the level of evidence. So as you get towards the top, you know, that's, we're going to have the best for both things. So a green recommendation, you know, is pretty much recommended saying we have, we're pretty, we're really, really confident the benefit is better than the risk. And if you start moving down, you'll start seeing yellow, orange, and then getting reds. Yellows are okay. You know, class two, a is like, well, we probably feel like it's, it's the benefit is over, you know, over, overweighs the risks. But as you start to move down, you say, oh, I'm not quite sure until we get in the red where it's like, ah, oh, man, this is probably not good. You know, a class three is like, we're actually harming. We don't want to do that. And so that's kind of the, on the left side and the right side is the quality of evidence means meaning like, you know, on the top here, we have, you know, really high quality evidence from more than one randomized control. mass trials. we go down, it's, you know, maybe, you know, one randomized control trial or going down maybe observational. So once again, the hierarchy that we've kind of talked about before in terms of randomized control trials, observational trials, all that stuff, this kind of gives evidence there. And this, you know, I won't talk about this as much, but this is throughout the document. So it's important. I just want to mention it. And so first of all, let's talk some numbers here, right? So when we're looking at a lipid panel, right? A lot of times our LDL is not counted. Actually, most of the time it's almost never counted directly. It's a, a calculation. And here's something called the Friedenwald equation. This is the most common one that's used to calculate LDL. So you, you can see it does incorporate total cholesterol, triglycerides, and HDL. And essentially the calculation for LDL is total cholesterol minus triglycerides divided by five minus HDL. And that should give you, you know, your general LDL. This is typically accurate if your triglycerides are normal. However, if your triglycerides are elevated or your LDL is super, super low, then this is not going to be the most beneficial thing. Um, like I said, it's not directly counted. This is an estimate, you know, but if it's, if they're normal, pretty good indicator. Um, and we can kind of go from there. There's other equations you can use if the LDL is lower than 70, like the Martin at all approach. But like I said, that's kind of new here and there. And another thing too, is when we're getting these tests, we can do it fasting or non-fasting for a risk assessment generally. So if the average person who has an average risk, or we don't know of any family history, it's okay to get faster or non-fasting. What that means is when you get your lipid panel, you know, doctors will sometimes tell you like, oh, you need to be fasting. 
And for this, for like general assessment, we don't need to do that. And in general, LDL is going to change minimally with normal eating and triglycerides and HDL, you know, both fasting and non-fasting seem to have similar prognostic values in regards to the cardiovascular outcomes. And so it's not that important in a perfect world. Yes. I would have you fast overnight or at least eight to 12 hours from eating. That's ideal. So that way we can pretty much eliminate triglycerides. Um, but that being said, the world's not perfect. And if someone comes to your clinic, it's like, ah, I didn't fast. Like, what do you tell them? Don't get labs. So no. So it's okay here to get fasting or non-fasting. I prefer non-fasting, but like I said, that's okay. Um, and like I said, you can also use non-fasting for risk assessment as well for starting meds. So if, if someone's really, really high and they've done non-fasting, you can technically start on that. You know, I'm probably going to have a confirmatory one if that's just me, but based off of the guidelines, you can use non-fasting for that. The one exception really is if someone has familial hypercholesterolemia or there's a concern for that, you don't want to do a non-fasting. You really want to get fasting just because um, that seems to not have as good prognostic indication. But so once again here, like I said, we are calculating LDL and we can use fasting or non-fasting. Next, we're going to talk about some different biomarkers that we have, right? Just cholesterol, LDL, ApoB, other things. In general, what they kind of recommend is that ApoB is better than non-HDL, better than LDLC, kind of as atherogenic indicators. Meaning, like we've talked about in our physiology lectures, the ApoB are you know the apolipoprotein that's on the atherogenic particles, like the LDL, VLDL, IDL, and so that is our best one. We're counting, you know. For every one of those ApoB, we have one particle. So it's a really good number for that. A non-HDL is kind of a approximate a surrogate for that as well, which is a little bit better and then better than, I should say a little bit worse than ApoB, but better than LDL. And whereas LDL is what we use if we got it, um, but if we have the other two measures, we'll typically do that. Um, on top of that, cholesterol, you know, if it's less than 150 and LDL around 100, in general, like people have pretty decent outcomes. So that seems to be like the general cutoff points where like, oh, you know, if you're just like ballpark and you're like, I don't care at all. Like that seems to be like, oh, you know, the general thing. we have much more nuanced ways of looking at things now, but that's one thing. And then also the general recommendations for this major risk factors when combined with LDL is cigarette smoking, hypertension, dysglycemia or blood sugar abnormalities, and then your age. Those are the four things that you'll see kind of factor into different equations we have and calculators, but these are like four main risk factors for, you know, atherosclerotic heart disease. So these are identified. And like I said, when we know these and we can see the strength recommendations are very strong for these that, Hey, like these things we're looking out for, but this is the, these are kind of the biomarkers we're talking about. Okay. Moving on here next, we're going to talk about apolipoprotein B and lipoprotein A. We talked a little bit about apoPB before, but apoB is the major apolipoprotein on VLDL and LDL or the atherogenic particles. Essentially, it's essentially it's a proxy for non-HDL. So everything that's not HDL will be on apoB and apoB. There's just going to be one particle and one apoB. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship, which is really nice. Helps us estimate it. When you might do this, well, it can be helpful if triglycerides are elevated. Like we talked about before, if triglycerides are elevated, then that may not make our LDL calculation very accurate. So this can be a, a better indicator for that. And once again, if we look at it and we have an ApoB that's over 130, we consider that almost similar to an LDL of 160, essentially, which is a risk enhancing factor. And we'll talk more about risk enhancing factors. But what those do is they essentially just drive it up a notch. Say if you have, you know, no risk factors, but you have risk enhancing factor, then that's another, you know, just a piece of the equation. You know, and we look at all the different things and then these risk enhancing factors later, we'll talk more, but that can kind of raise your risk a little bit. On top of that, we also check something called LPA or lipoprotein A. This is a modified form of LDL that's more athrogenic. You know, a lot of times we're going to check these if we have early heart disease and family or personal history of heart disease. That's not explained. Obviously explained means if you have you know, diabetes and you smoke and you have a heart attack, well, we have a pretty good reason for why that happened. But if you don't have a good reason or don't have risk factors, then we check lipoprotein A, which is usually a separate test. We have to get there. Um, but once again, if this is elevated above 50 milligrams per deciliter or 125 nanomoles per liter, then that would be considered a risk enhancing factor as well. And so that is kind of one that we use not all the time, but you kind of have to have a suspicion for it to say, Hey, we want to look for this because we're worried about your risk factors. All right. Next we're going to talk about monitoring response therapy. This is something that we do not do very well in the primary care world. You know, when we start someone on medication, a lot of times we check, we, we do it and say, okay, you're on it. It's good. But we should really be checking it more frequently to see and make sure we're having the response we want. So essentially, you know, when we, a given dose should have a similar percentage reduction and you know, they talk about LDL essentially is what it's like the LDLC we talk about. And what it comes down to is usually, you know, a 38.7 milligrams per deciliter decrease leads to about a 21% relative risk reduction in ACVD. And so we say, you know, per every decrease of this amount, we tend to see this much improvement. And that's kind of what it goes to. And the rough equation is that a 1% decrease is about a 1% reduction in ASCVD risk. And so, like I said, we will see with statins, when you start someone on medication, they will produce similar percentage reductions in LDL. And if we don't, then that kind of clues us into some other things, but this is something we should be monitoring as we go along. We'll talk more about it later. 
Additionally, it would not be a good talk here on building lifelong athletes if we didn't talk about lifestyle recommendations, right? This is like the number one thing. You know, before we do any sort of medication, we're always doing lifestyle recommendations. And we've beaten this to death in other podcasts, but essentially patients should always consume a dietary pattern that emphasizes, you know, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, healthy protein sources, and, you know, uh, trying to avoid lots of saturated fats, sugar, su- sugar, sweetened beverages, all that stuff. So like I said, nothing groundbreaking here on top of that, obviously recommending that, you know, you shouldn't eat excess calories. So you should be eating caloric needs to not gain weight or to lose weight if you have obesity or overweight, which like I said, all these things we've talked about before. And on top of that, physical activity, we know they mentioned here aerobic exercise three to four times per week, lasting 40 minutes at moderate intensity. But obviously, you know, the more you do better and I'd recommend resistance training on top of that as well. But um, like I said, I don't ever want to come across as just saying, hey, we're going to talk about medications and that's it because lifestyle is going to be the cornerstone of everything we do. Um, But the guidelines are not necessarily drawn on that. So, but I want to mention it. All right, next we're gonna talk about metabolic syndrome. So we've talked about a little before touched on it, but this is another risk enhancing factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. To make the diagnosis, you have to have three of the following five. So you have to have an elevated waist circumference. We've talked about it before previously, um, different for men versus heel, but elevated waist circumference, elevated triglycerides, reduced HDL, elevated blood pressure, or elevated flat fasting glucose. Like I said, all these things, we care about this because People who have metabolic syndrome have an increased risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and all-cause mortality. And right now, about a third of the people in the U.S. have this. So this is like America in a nutshell, the metabolic syndrome. So if we can help prevent this, identify it, we're going to save ourselves a lot of complications down the line. All right, next we're going to move on to LDL lowering medications. So there's multiple medications that we can take. Like I said, there's going to be a whole different you know, strategy for when you implement them and whatnot. But, you know, for statins specifically, there's three categories. We have a high potency, moderate potency, low potency. And if you look on the table on the right, we're going to talk about, you know, the high intensity, moderate and low. That's based off of the response we expect to get with them. So, you know, high intensity, we expect to see greater than 50%, per, you know, improvement in our lipids. So our LDL should be lowered by about 50% with high intensity, moderate, anywhere from 30 to 49, and then low is less than 30%. And you can see here, not super important, but to know necessarily, but the high intensity ones are going to be a torvastatin and resuvastatin. Um, and that's kind of like the biggest thing. And if you know if it's, you know, and especially at those doses, a torvastatin 40 or 80 or super at 20 or 40. And so anything else there is not high intensity. That's kind of how I think about it. So if you know the high intensity ones, then everything else falls in place there. Additionally, like I said, we talked about, let's say we're on a Torvastatin, you know, 80, right? So we're maxed out. We should have a high, that's a high intensity statin. We should have a decrease of more than 50%. Now we talk about our other medications. This is the percentage we have adding on top of, of our statins, what we should get. So like azetamibe should lower about 13 to 20% extra. Bile acid sequesterants can do another 15 to 30, depending. PCSK9, anywhere from like 40s to 60%. It's insane, the results that they have. And then niacin and fibroid medications previously were, were once thought to be elder or lowering meds. Now we don't consider it anymore. Um, they might help with triglycerides, but we're, they're not in our normal um, arsenal for treating or lowering our LDL. All right, so now let's talk about patient management groups. What I mean by patient man- management groups is we're going to talk about in this whole document, they talk about people in specific groups. So elderly or young or have diabetes. So we're going to talk about you know recommendations for those specific people. The first group we're going to talk about is those with secondary atherosclerotic prevention. So essentially what's this mean is that someone has a history of acute coronary syndrome or had a heart attack or an end STEMI or a, a STEMI, you know, history maybe had a stroke or a TIA or peripheral artery disease, a bunch of different things that are equivalent to that. But essentially, if you have a known history of having an event of cardiovascular disease, you know, you have had that already. So we can't prevent, prevent that. So essentially secondary prevention means we're going to prevent a second time or a, you know, subsequent time from that happening. So that's what we're looking at here. This group here, our goal is when we get them, we should have a 50% reduction, um, in our LDL. That's like a goal. It should be on a high intensity statin. You know, like I said, if you can't tolerate it, you know, the recommendations are go up to a moderate, you know, we're still going to get 30 to 49% lower, which is great. And then if, if, you know, if you need to, we can add on things, but you know, that's just normal high risk. If you're very high risk, like you had multiple or whatnot, they consider adding on a PCSK9 um, to that statin, or like I said, a Zetamon on top of that. The goal for someone here is going to be less than 70 um, in our LDL or less than 100 non HDL. Once again, so kind of the stepwise approach to this, if you think about it, you know, we want to get 50% reduction, right? So we just step back 50% reduction in our LDL. If we get that awesome, cool, we're good. And we're, and that's what we want. If we don't get that and we're still above 70, we can add on a Zetamib or PCSK9, like I said, or if we can't tolerate a, a high intensity one, we can do a moderate intensity statin, and then we can add on that as well. So there's multiple ways to do this, but we know it's important for these people who've had 
heart attack, stroke, whatever, it's important to get them on a statin or at least LDL lowering medication or lifestyle or something like that to lower LDL aggressively because we seem to have better outcomes when we do that. You know, it also seems that the greatest benefit comes to those who have the higher LDLs, right? So if you had LDL of you know, 190, they're going to probably going to have more benefit than those who had an LDL of 100. That's just kind of how it works. When you start getting above 75 um, years old, you can consider statins. You have a risk benefit discussion. It's not as slam dunk. You have to consider the side effects, but um, it looks like that's for high intensity. For moderate intensity, you can still do that as well. And then, like I said, high intensity statin did have better outcomes than moderate statins. But once again, we think it's due to the LDL lowering effect. So once again, moderate plus azetamibe may reduce similar results. And so that's the thing too. Like if someone's here um, and they can't tolerate a high intensity statin, we can, take, can tolerate a, a moderate intensity statin. Okay, we can add on that things we can add combo at the end of the day all we really care about is like the ldl lowering effect right so it doesn't matter like you have to be on this medications because it's magic you know we think that it's probably the ldl lowering you know there's some evidence to statin in terms of stabilizing plaques and other things that it may or may not do but at the end of the day we're going for like ldl lowering is our goal and then to do that effectively also we can use pcsk9 inhibitors which are fantastically efficient but also crazy expensive and so that is a challenging thing for many physicians is trying to get those approved for people but this is for people like i said secondary prevention like how aggressive we're being very aggressive that's how it goes all right and this is just kind of a flow chart kind of talking about what we just talked about previously you know this is for those who have a clinical history of ascvd or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease obviously once again you see healthy lifestyle always the most important thing and then breaks up in those categories people who are not at very high risk or people who are very very high risk and very high risk people as you see on the right here are those who had multiple major events or one major one and have high risk conditions. So lots of different reasons why you could be at high risk. And like I said, we're just going through here. When you're less than 75, still talking about the high intensity statin, lower than LDL. If a high intensity statin is not tolerated, use modern intensity. You know, if you're on maximal therapy, still above 70, then consider adding Zetamibe. And like I said, and this is just like the flow chart we talked about before. And so once again, I don't need to beat a dead horse here, but this is a really, really helpful one. And on the right, we kind of talk about very high risk of future atherosclerotic events, right? And this is kind of things we worry about, right? So people who had recent ACS, history of heart attack or stroke, and then some high risk conditions on the bottom that make you more concerned as well. You know, we like algorithms in medicine. It makes us feel good, it makes us feel comfortable. But at the end of the day, algorithms are just like recommendations in terms of, hey, this is how we think about it. And understanding behind it is more important. So like this flow chart shows essentially that, you know, if you have this, you do this, but like, what's the understanding? Well, I think the understanding behind this is that we're trying to intensely lower LDL. You know, so our goal is greater than 50 in these high risk patients and trying to get that LDL number below 70. And so understanding that I think is the most important concept, not necessarily like, oh, I tried this, I have to do this. Like, like I said, don't just bang your head against the wall and expect something to change or you know get different results. Think about what we need to accomplish and then go from there and pick the tools that you think will work best to get to that position. All right, the next set of people we're gonna talk about are those with severe hypercholesterolemia. So essentially LDL above 190. This is you know pretty straightforward in terms of if your LDL is above 190, they're going to recommend putting on a statin. Um, if you're especially in the 20 to 75 age group, you know, with 190, they want a max tolerated statin. So meaning if, if we can, uh, you know, high intensity, but if not moderate and do what we can, the goal is to decrease by 50%. And if not, or still above 100 in the LDL, we want to add on a Zetamibe. So that's kind of like been our one-two punch is right. A statin and then a Zetamibe if need be. You know, if triglycerides are elevated as well, might want to add on a bile acid sequestrant. That's possible as well. And once again, if the ages we go here, if we're 30 to 75 with a history of familial hypercholesteremia or LDL greater than 100, you know, still on the statin, then we can start talking about PCSK9. So getting PCSK9s are hard. Like I said, one of the conditions is FH that will essentially help you get, you know, accepted for one of those, or if you've had an event potentially, but that's when we think about. And then or as I said, if we have someone with an LDL greater than 220 or 130 on a max statin therapy, then PCSK9 is considered as well. And we have huge improvement with PCSK9. That's why those are the ones that we use when we have a long way to go. Like if the LDL is really elevated, PCSK9s seem to have um, a lot of improvement. And like I said, at the end of the day, the best bang for your buck is once again to be those with the highest LDL. So if you have super, super high LDL, we're going to see our greatest improvement when we do that. All right, another population that's super important is those with diabetes. Um, those with diabetes, so if you're 40 to 75 with diabetes, regardless of your atherosclerotic risk or whatnot, the recommendations are to put on a modern intensity statin. You know, you should you should still calculate the ASCVD score. We have uh, a calculator that I can link to in about trying to calculate our you know 10 your risks you know risk of events in 10 years. And so what we're saying here is we want to put someone on a statin regardless of what that calculator would say because that doesn't necessarily equate to their high risk, but that actually may upgrade them. You know, you might type in the other things and then maybe they're, you know, 
ages 50 or they have and they smoke or they have hypertension that might move them up to a higher risk category where they might classify for a high risk statin or a high um, potency statin so essentially here what we're saying is that those 40 75 with diabetes should be on a moderate intensity statin but they could potentially also be on a high intensity statin if they qualify as well um, lots of risk factors like you said if you have diabetes and risk factors we're thinking about goal reduction greater than 50 percent and then once again once we get 75 plus and on a statin okay to continue not as you know not as clear and then if you're age 20 39 so below that 40 you can consider starting if you have a risk enhancer which other risk enha enhancers are on the right here for diabetes meaning you know it might have some kidney issues retinopathy neuropathy um, or have you know had it for many many years that you're going to consider that so like I said, with those with diabetes, though, they tend to have earlier and worse outcomes for cardiovascular disease. So it's super important to try to prevent this as much as possible and to attack it as early and aggressively as we can. All right. So now we're talking about, you know, we're getting out of the, the realm of like those with risk factors. We're just going like regular primary prevention. So they're just like your average folks, you were coming to the doctor's appointment and what do we do here? Well, specifically children, adolescents, and young adults, 20 to 39, usually like lifestyle is all they recommend. Usually they're not super aggressive saying you need to do this. And if you look on the right here, this is a super nice flow chart kind of saying, Hey, what are the, what are the things we think about here? And we'll kind of walk that through what this means. But like I said, the, the do not pass, go start a medication or aggressively lower LDLs. If usually your LDL is above 190 or select patients above 160, but essentially if you see 190, they're going to recommend, Hey, you should be on a statin. Um, or if you're once again, 40 to 75 with diabetes, they're going to do that. And then what happened here, if we're adults, you're 40 to 75. So that's kind of like our, our main group, right? Like the reason they don't recommend necessarily as aggressively in 20, 39 year olds is because they say, Hey, you know, we know this is a lifelong disease. There's discussions on whether that's, you know, wise or not, but essentially they're not going to recommend anything other than lifestyle, unless it's really egregious, um, when they're 20, 39, just because the risk of having an event is so low. That being said, it's not necessarily low in the future. Um, but that's another discussion here, but their recommendations would be 40, 75 is kind of where it targets, you know, for here, we're going to use looking at ASCVD, you know, percentage. So essentially what we do here is there's different calculators. We can do a 10 year calculation and a 30 year calculator. Usually we base off the 10 year calculator. What we'll do is essentially put your numbers in terms of your LDL, your age, your blood pressure, you know, are you on a medication? Do you have diabetes? All these things in a calculator and it'll kind of classify you into a risk, meaning low risk, less than 5%. Borderline is that five to 7.5 intermediate 7.5. It's less than 20. And then a great greater than 20 is going to be high risk. And that kind of stratifies you as to like, well, what do we do? Do we need to have a discussion? You know, do we talk about just lifestyle? Do we talk about the medications? And that's kind of how we think about it. And if it's still not clear, you know, because I said you can do a CAC, which is a coronary artery calcium score, which is essentially like an X-ray looking if you can any, any calcium deposits in in any of the coronary arteries. And essentially that can be helpful if you're unsure, right? If it's kind of in the middle, you know, if your CAC score is greater than zero though, that kind of makes us say, eh, what does it mean for it? But if it's, you know, CAC is zero, that kind of puts you in a lower risk group. So I just want to let you know, like, this does not mean like, because I fall in a category, I'm automatically going to get a statin. Like, first of all, you're in charge of anything, but this is just the recommendations you're going to get. And what I want to just get across is that like, we should be having these nuanced conversations with everybody and your physician, um, or if you are a physician, you should be having these conversations with patients to kind of help them understand their risk and then work together to kind of come with an equation. So what I'm trying to say though, is that this should not be a everyone gets a medication in here automatically, right? This is, our, our world should not be just algorithms, right? Where it's nuanced and things are difficult. So this should just kind of help provoke, provoke a discussion, right? And so say, hey, you fall in this category, these are the risks, these are the benefits, yada, yada, I kind of talk about that. So this is a joint decision. And I just want everyone to know that, like I said, it's not doing anyone to do anything they don't want to do, um, but it's kind of helping us guide our discussion. All right, and so kind of stepping off from, we talked about the percentages and high risk, low risk, what does that mean? Well, this is where we get it from, the pool cohort equations. Essentially what this is used is it helps predict a 10 year risk of having an event, you know, and this is based off of data from multiple huge cohort studies. And essentially these are the numbers they found from there and the risk factors that go into the calculator. So the big things are usually age, smoking, total cholesterol, HDL, hypertension, and diabetes. Like those are the big, big things that go into the equation. And then once you have the number like you know low risk medium intermediate high you know whatever you have your risks and then on top of that we have something called risk enhancing factors now so this is kind of new and relatively you know a new concept so it's not as formulaic which can be challenging sometimes for some people but this is nice because it offers a nuanced discussion so risk enhancing factors are things like family history of premature ASCVD, primary hypercholesterolemia, like I said, the 160 to 190 range, metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, chronic inflammatory conditions like psoriasis, RA, HIV AIDS, history of premature menopause, um, or high-risk pregnancy 
outcomes like preeclampsia, some high risk ethnicities like South Asians, you know, and then other biomarkers we've talked about in terms of if you have elevated CRP, elevated LPA, uh, elevated ABOB or ABI, which is ankle brachial index less than 0.9. So all these things on the right, that's those table. These are just for your consideration, right? Because if you think about it, if you drop back here, we have someone in a borderline risk or an intermediate risk zone, and then they have multiple of these risk enhancing factors. Well, that might change the calculus. We might go from someone who's, oh, I'm not too worried about to, oh, actually, you've got some reasons I should be concerned. We should maybe be a little bit more aggressive. And so this is what it is. It's just offering a more nuanced, you know, appreciation in, in conversation with people. And like we talked about here, these are the categories again, five, five, five to seven, seven point five to twenty, and then above twenty. And like I said, we also have a 20, 30 year calculator, which kind of shows you like your, what's your events way in the future possibility. It doesn't give categories, like just percentages of having it. And that's actually really, really um, eye-opening when you do it, just say your lifelong events, essentially it's like 30 year risk calculator. Like what's the odds you have an event in 30 years? And it's pretty darn high for a lot of people. And so this offers us an option to, if people don't fit in the box and they say like, oh, you look, you know, everything looks fine, but I have a family history of, you know, people with heart attacks in their forties. And I'm really worried about that. Well, then this might bump, be able to bump them up or at least start the conversation and say, Hey, okay, maybe we are going to control this a little more carefully. We're going to start on a medication or be really intense with our lifestyle therapy or whatnot. It just offers a unique and nuanced perspective. Like I said, and on the calculator, you have to remember that age is going to dominate it because generally it works well for the population, but not everybody that works for, it. you know, it's based on age. Cause as you accumulate over time, things tend to get worse, but everyone's going to be different. And so, so borderline intermediate people are going to have discussions. And, and, and that's like I said, what I want to take away is that we need to have discussions about this. All right. The question is then, do we get a coronary artery calcium score or not? You know, that's the, the question that we have. I think the big thing is, you know, it's going to be useful for those you're considering statin, right? So for most people, if they want to know what their risk and they say, I you know, do not want to start a statin medication or uh, I'm borderline, maybe not getting a CAC might be helpful because if we see something that is you know, egregiously bad, then that might change the calculus a little bit. Usually the CAC score is zero. Um, like I said, pretty low risk for ASCB in the next 10 years. There are some exceptions to that. It's not foolproof. If you have a CAC greater than 100, uh, like I said, that's going to be essentially it's going to get your risk up and increase that. And then if your CAC's in between one and 99, it's kind of no man's land. We have a discussion of what does that mean? Um, you know, the question is we don't have awesome data. Like, do we do this every 10 years? Uh, we don't know how frequently we have to do it. And so like I said, at the end of the day, what this does is it helps us make clinical decisions, right? So if it's zero, that makes us feel a lot better. Um, if it's greater than hundred, pretty easy. We need to be on a, you know, lipid lowering medication typically. And then in between is kind of what we figure out. Um, the one thing is we have to mention in terms of, this does have radiation. The radiation is similar to a mammogram. So not a crazy amount. So pretty tolerable and, and low amount, but it is still there. Also, a CAC score is not valid if you're already on a statin. We know that statins actually increase CAC scores, but improve clinical outcomes. So kind of, it's that kind of a head scratcher, but um, we, if you're on a statin, we expect to see more calcium in the CAC score. And so we kind of invalidates the score. On top of that, they also recommend that CAC, even if it's zero, it doesn't really matter if you're a smoker, if you have diabetes or super strong history of ASCVD um, or possibly chronic inflammatory conditions like HIV. They say that still has a substantial 10 year risk. And so even for CAC zero and you're still smoking like a chimney and have diabetes, they wouldn't recommend say, oh, okay, it's zero. So you're fine. All right, and once again here, like I said, talking about primary prevention groups, LDL is between 70 and 189 because we know if it's above 189, then we're going to start a medication. But this intermediate risk group, you know, 7.5 to 20%, this is where we have discussions about moderate statin. Um, I think it's for most people, like I said, it's going to have that newest conversation. But if we do decide on that, the goal is 30% reduction. Um, and like I said, the statin is going to be favored if risk enhancing factors are, are present. Like I said, all the risk enhancing factors we talked about, but like, once again, just having a discussion here, this is not dooming you to a statin, but if you are in this range, 40 to 75 with an LDL in that range of 70 to 190, um, it's usually going to be a discussion. All right, and then when we're monitoring a response to treatment, right? We start a medication, we should recheck things in like four to 12 weeks after initiation or a dose adjustment, see how we're doing, right? And then we should check every three to 12 months to make sure that everything is, you know, going well, that we're adhering to it, that it's safe, everything's going well. Um, when we're looking at, you know, percents that we should think about, you know, if we're looking at an adjustment for a diet, typically we'll see a decrease in 10 to 15%, which is great. Like I said, and moderate statins, 30 to 49, high intensity, 50 or above. You know, if we're adding on azetamide, where you give azetamide, we typically think about 15 to 25%. And then PCSK9, we talked about, and we're like the 40 to 60. So it can be quite a bit. So now primary prevention in those above 75, it's a little more gray. 
If the LDL is between 7189 and moderate statin may be appropriate, data is pretty mixed. There's no real strong recommendation. On top of that, though, it's also recommended that you may be reasonable to stop medications in certain situations. Like if you're having, you know, cog cognitively declining, frail, decreased life expectancy, it might be easier to just stop the medication because there's no real good data that it's doing a huge improvement. Um, and then on top of that, if you did somehow get a CAC, they'd say, okay, um, you know, probably don't need a medic you know, medication if we have a CAC of zero, but something to just think about. And then once again, primary prevention for age 20 to 39, a lot of times it's going to be lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. That's what we can talk about. You should also check to see if there's other causes of elevated lipids. Things like hypothyroidism, liver disease, or renal disease can cause lipid abnormalities. So we look at that. Once again, if it's way high above 190 or 160 with multiple risk factors, can consider medication. Otherwise, it's helpful to calculate lifetime risk. Um, can also consider a CAC here if you want to, but this is, like I said, we're not in that prime 40, 75, so this is going to be a risk-benefit risk discussion with your doctor. And moving on to kids, you know, if essentially for kids, if you're age 10, LDL is greater than 190 or 160 with concern for, for FH and they don't respond to intense three to six months of lifestyle, statins can start in children. Um, we do give these in kids who have familial hypercholesterolemia and really, really high LDLs and seem to be, do really well with it. And the reason why this is so important to check is because Abnormal lipids are seen in one in every five children and severe meaning greater than 190 and about one every 250 kids. So that's a lot. And it's also important because this is a lifelong risk, right? Data shows good short and long-term improvement in lipid numbers with lifestyle changes. So, and no stunting in growth or maturation and like that. So they seem to do pretty well with it, but we care about this so much because like I said, it's that lifetime exposure that we're worried about. And if you're getting it super, super young, then we're worried about diseases and having events really early in life. And they mentioned like having a concern for familiar hypercholesterolemia. What does that mean? Well, typically if your LDL is 160 and you have a family history of CHD or a parent with similarly raised cholesterol, then you think about, oh, could be doing that. And once again, I want to mention we're only starting medication after a trial lifestyle changes, right? We should make sure we're looking at all of the variables that could be going into this. Also for children, we should be monitoring for abnormal liver values, CK and myopathy symptoms. So myopathy meaning muscle symptoms, you know, at, you could start as young as age eight is possible, but essentially, um, like I said, it's going to be a, a big risk benefit discussion we have in there. And then on top of that, like I said, if there's no risk factors, you don't have a history of FH, then checking usually around nine to 11 is re recommended for everybody. And then once again, between 17 and 21 as LDL tends to increase about 10% with puberty. All right. And so there are some ethnicity variations that we should be considered about. Um, some ethnicities have a higher risk for certain factors. You know, of note, this is not separate. There's not separate pooled cohort equations for Asian Americans or Hispanic or Latino Americans, but there is a separate pooled cohort equation. So a calculator for black Americans that should be used to kind of help stratify their risk. It's important to take heritage and nationality into consideration when talking with the patient, right? Because if you tell them, hey, you need to eat this specifically, like, it might not be part of the culture or someone might not think that's reasonable. And so it's just understanding and talking with that. A couple of the things we look for here, you know, there are heightened risks in South Asians, increased sensitivity to statins in East Asians, like Japanese Asians. Um, you may have seen increased hypertension in black patients. Um, also might have a high ASCVD risk in Native Americans or Alaskans. Um, and then what's kind of tricky is Hispanic and Latino is a very nonspecific term. So it's hard to definitively categorize. So once again, should talk about their country of origin, socioeconomic status, and acculturation level to help better understand risks and benefits. There's a huge table in this document that is really helpful for understanding, looking at the risks, but it's just always worth mentioning that, Hey, um, not everybody's the same. And sometimes their ethnic background may, you know, lead to some other risk. Quickly talking about hypertriglyceridemia as well. And you said if you're age 20 and if it's moderate, meaning you're in the range of elevated between 175 and 49, they recommend treating with lifestyle, addressing secondary factors, maybe some medications that could be causing it. Um, that's what we're looking for. When we are looking at elevated triglycerides though, it's just important to remember that triglycerides are carried by VLDL, and, or VLDL and chylomicrons if it's really severe. And so we care about this because VLDLs are atherogenic, right? So we want to reduce this. So if we have really, really high triglycerides, that means we have more VLDL around and then we're worried about that. And on top of that, we also care a lot about this is because we can get pancreatitis from this. Usually that starts to happen when it gets above 500. And so that's when we care about it. But um, this is why it's really important. And so when we're talking about addressing secondary factors as well, you know, things about metabolic syndrome, look at, looking for, evaluate for diabetes, kidney problems that can, be, can cause this as well, or hypothyroidism can also cause elevated triglycerides. Some medications people could be on, things like oral estrogen, um, tamoxifen, raloxifen, retinoids, immunosuppressive drugs, beta blockers, um, some atypical anti 
psychotic meds, um, thiazide, diuretics, diuretics, glucocorticoids, just basically a bunch of medications can cause this. And so if you see a, someone who has elevated triglycerides, it's worth mentioning, just thinking of your brain, like, okay, are there medications that could be causing this? There are lots. Um, so if we get into that 40 to 75 age though, with moderate triglycerides, once again, that 175 to 49, and their ASC VD is greater than 7.5, then discuss starting statin because statins will help decrease triglycerides as well. And then once again, though, if their triglycerides are above 500, then we need to treat that definitely. Um, if it's over a thousand, then we need to try to find a cause, start a statin, and then plus or minus a fibrate and intense lifestyle changes. Um, you know, a lot of times the recommendations for that are low fat diet, avoid refined carbohydrates and alcohol and consume omega-3 fatty acids. And it's worth mentioning that if you are going to start a fibrate, they recommend a phenofibrate is better than gemfibrozil because of a low risk of myopathy. Sometimes if you combine gemfibrozil with a statin, it can lead to um, myopathy or muscle problems. All right, now talking about women's specific issues. Um, if you had a history of premature menopause, so before age 40, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, had a small for gestational age infant, or preterm delivery, these may all be additional risk factors. Um, additionally, childbearing age women on statins should consider birth control options. It is teratogenic and can cause issues to the developing baby. And so if you do desire to get pregnant, should stop the statin one to two months before attempting to become pregnant. Um, like I said, for women specifically, like I said, these risk factors, a lot of people don't think about, they just think, oh, I'm healthy, I'm young, and then you bounce back and you're fine. But a lot of times we find that if you had these things like the gestational diabetes or preeclampsia, it can lead to risks down the line um, as well. And we care so much because for women, a lot of times it happens later in life, but it's just something to keep it, keep an eye on. Um, and on top of that, we will expect lipids and triglycerides to go up during pregnancy. Um, but once again, statins are contraindicated due to potential birth defects or miscarriage risks. So we would not want to control those with statins during medication. Next category is adults with CK or chronic kidney disease. If you're age 40 to 75 with an LDL in the, you know, the inner between area with the ASCVD greater than 7.5, um, once again, CKD is a risk enhancing feature, which we talked about. This is a conversation on whether we should continue, you know, statin or not if you're on dialysis, but if you're not on dialysis, it's pretty much going to be a risk enhancing factor. So you probably should be on it. Um, if you are on dialysis and they talk about starting medications, probably not um, anything you need to do. But like I said, if you're already on one, you might can have a discussion on whether you want to keep it going or not. Next, adults with the chronic inflammatory conditions, these are risk enhancing factors, things like you know, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, HIV, AIDS, all these things can be a high risk. This is a risk enhancing factor. So we kind of think about that. And additionally for HIV, it's still a high risk even if viremia is under control, which is interesting. So the ASCVD calculator may not be validated in inflammatory conditions. So that's another thing why we consider this a risk enhancing factor and it's not actually in there. And so um, it can be helpful to, to kind of understand that. You want to get baseline lipids and then recheck four to 12 weeks after starting, you know, different medications, either anti-inflammatories or, you know, immune modulators or antiretrovirals. So thinking about getting them early before and then after, and then it may be helpful to check like after things have calmed down, right? Because a lot of times when you're in acute inflammatory response, everything might look bad. And so if we get it under control, it might show a different story. And at the same time, like I said, if you're in this category, it doesn't guarantee a statin, but it just gives you a high risk and to kind of have that discussion. Once again, statin, no statin. Do we want to get a coronary artery calcium score? All those discussions. All right, next, it would not be a good discussion. We didn't talk about statin safety and side effects, right? So overall, these are very well tolerated, but we should always, always, always be talking with your patients or your doctor about this. Statin associated muscle symptoms are associated with myalgias and kind of been seen in five to 20% of patients. So like I said, that can be a decent you know, bit. The presentation for that is usually it's bilateral. So both sides, proximal muscles is so kind of like more shoulders, hips onset within weeks to months after starting the statin. And then usually stops when you stop the statin. So they resolves with that. Some predisposing factors of that, it can be female sex, low BMI. Um, there's certain CYP3A4, which is in the liver, kind of help metabolize things. If you have that um, inhibitor, that might lead to an issue. Um, patients with HIV, renal, liver, or thyroid issues, and then excess alcohol intake or um, high, high, really high levels of physical activity may lead to that as well. Very rare to have really severe muscle symptoms, things like rhabdomyolysis with elevated CK. A lot of times that is not a, a risk factor that happens. It doesn't happen very often. Also, people talk about diabetes saying, this is going to give me diabetes. And they found that typically new onset diabetes is possible, yes, but it's usually only seen a very specific phenotype with those with like a BMI greater than 30, fasting blood glucose already over 100, so we're already in like the pre-diabetes range or the metabolic syndrome or with an A1C already above six. So essentially, if you're in this like pre-diabetes range, it may like tip you over into diabetes, um, but usually the risk-benefit ratio we talk about like, well, if you're already in that 
issue there in that you know pre-diabetes range would you benefit from a statin so like i said it's not like we're seeing people who are just like total meta, totally metabolically healthy except for just some abnormal lipids put them on a statin off something at diabetes it's usually like you were cheating there and just sends you over the edge a little bit so typically, what do you do with the half statin associated muscle symptoms? Well, typically stop the med. We recommend stop the medication, you know, rest, and then they recommend restarting at a lower dose or try a different statin or try a different dosing strategy. Meaning, hey, if I give this medication daily, let's switch it up to every other day, see if we can tolerate that. Like I said, there's also something that's a super rare, you know, statin associated autoimmune myopathy, which once again, you have profound muscle weakness, marked and elevated CK um, lab, menus, lab enzymes, um, also going to have incomplete resolution when you stop the statin. So usually like the one that's not as bad when you stop the statin, things get better. This one, it doesn't you usually do want to get a neurologist on more for that. Once again, that's super rare. And then in terms of labs, everyone used to say, Oh, I need to check all my liver enzymes. They don't recommend that. They typically say you only need to get labs. If you're having severe symptoms, um, you'll typically see an asymptomatic increase in LFTs. Um, occasionally that can happen if it's, you know, greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Um, you can kind of think about reducing the dose or switching it. Once again, this is only with symptoms. Um, and they also kind of mentioned at least CoQ10 is mentioned where people are like, Oh, do I need to, do I need to take that? It doesn't seem to be helpful in reducing muscle symptoms. All right. Next we're going to talk about the implementation of these guidelines overall. They're not great. You know, I said, it's very challenging. We try to do our best, but it's, it's, it's tough to have a nuanced conversation in, you know, 10, 20 minutes, whatever they give you in re regular primary care. And so a lot of times the implementation and follow-up is not what we want it to be or based off of these recommendations, you know, and this here document, they're talking about having these discussions, these nuanced discussions, right? And that's really what it should be. It shouldn't be, Hey, you're on this, take this. It should be, Hey, you're in this zone. This is what this means. These are the risk benefits. This is what we're thinking and have that discussion. So like I said, it's super complicated. There's multifactorial. So this is going to be a nuanced discussion. Um, but once again, everything is better when the patient is involved. Shared decision making is really the kind of how we've like moved in our in the medicine now. It's like everyone should be making decisions together, and I, I cannot agree more with that. And so we have room to improve on implementation, but I want to let you know, hey, this is what we want to think about in terms of all these things I just mentioned, in terms of the risk factors, in terms of the you know risk enhancing factors. All those go into the calculus to kind of figure out, hey, should someone be on a lipid lower medication? All right, now I'm going to the last slide. This is a busy slide. I apologize, and I'm not going to read through it here. But these are essentially the big takeaways out just in summary here. So if you wanted to push pause or look at it, it's also in the document as well in the AACC and AHA guidelines. But the big thing is lifestyle is number one. And then it's if you're super, super high risk, we're going to be on a, a lower lipid lowering medication. And if you're in between, we're going to have discussions, right? The discussions are which medication? Do we need a medication? Do we just need a lifestyle? Do we need to get a, a CAC score done? All these things. It's very nuanced. You know, I don't want you to just think about, hey, I need to follow an algorithm. The algorithms are there to help. But this is when you look at the document, read it, you understand there's some wiggle room there to kind of have patient oriented and patient centered discussions with people to understand, hey, what are we doing? Where are we going from there? So that was a long one. I apologize, but this is a really crucial document. Thanks so much for sticking with me. I appreciate it. If you found this helpful, it would mean the world. And if you liked, comment, subscribe, or share with a friend, that'd be really helpful to get the word out. Um, but once again, thank you so much for taking time and out of your day and spending it with me. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll get off the computer and go live your life.